Welcome to our Ascension Parish Library presentation of the River Road African American Museum. We are glad you can be with us today to learn about the rich history and future vision of this wonderful museum right here in Donaldsonville. Our speaker today is Mr. Dara Hambrick, who co-founded the museum 26 years ago as a place to not only educate, but a place of healing and hope. Without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Daryl Hambrick, director of the museum. Good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the River Road African American Museum, and we're located in historic downtown Donisonville on the west bank of the Mississippi River uh, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, this community is filled with such a rich and uh, diverse history, um, and our museum has, has really been uh, the one to get, capture the highlights to bring this museum uh, to the forefront and this history to the forefront uh, so that we not only share with this community, but we share with the world. Uh, and we say thanks to the Ascension Parish Library for uh, coming in and, and being our virtual friend here during this time. And it's a difficult time right now for our museum because we can't have visitors to come in on a regular basis like we would like to. Um, it's Black History Month, and this is usually the time of year where everybody wants to come and engage in, in the history of uh, African Americans, especially here in South Louisiana. Uh, so today you get a, a highlight to come in virtually, and so we welcome you to our virtual tour here at River Road African American Museum. Once again, uh, on behalf of our museum, we welcome you uh, to historic Donisonville, uh, to the place where our museum resides at 406 Charles Street, um, right off of Railroad Avenue in the heart of the downtown area. Uh, our museum has been around for uh, 26 years. We've been in Donisonville um, uh, since 2002. Our museum uh, is dedicated to collecting and preserving and educating and interpreting artifacts and buildings that relate to the history of African Americans in rural communities along the Mississippi River. The home that you're looking at here where our museum resides is the home of Sylvia Watkins. Um, the building that you see now presently is the uh, former home of Dr. Sidney Brazier, who was a pharmacist uh, in Donaldsonville during the early 1900s. Uh, the photograph that you see right next to that building is actually of Dr. Lori. Dr. Lori was a physician here in Donaldsonville. Now, if you look at that house and you look at that photograph, what's the relation? Uh, Dr. Brazier and Dr. Lori were brothers. Um, and if you look at this home, you can see the kind of wealth that existed in this town uh, during that period. Uh, Dr. Lori um, attended New Orleans University, which is now um, a part of the uh, university system of Tulane University, where he got his medical degree. Uh, he was born in Plaquemine, Louisiana. Um, he also owned and operated the Africa Plantation, which is located in Modest, Louisiana. Here in the early 1900s, you have a Black physician and a Black pharmacist residing here in downtown Donaldsonville. The house that you see there is in um, a part of the historic restoration and um, hopefully we can get it back to its luster, um, just as we did with the home where our museum resides. As we take a journey through uh, history, uh, we're gonna meet some of the accomplishments um, even though our museum is about slavery and we talk about the hardships and those times, there were some things that happened that were really exciting. You take a look at this building right here. Um, this is called the True Friends Benevolent Hall. Benevolent societies were the first uh, HMOs or we say community uh, care groups that actually took care of the people in the community. Um, if you want to know more about benevolent societies, uh, the True Friends Hall is a great place to start. This building belongs to our museum and um, is in the process of being restored. It's another historic building that we 
we deem necessary as part of telling the vital history that goes along with um, life here along the, the Mississippi River. Um, this building was built um, in the early 1900s um, by men of the True Friends organization. This organization was set up to help uh, families in need. If there was a funeral, if there was a wedding, if there was a baby born, if uh, there was a doctor's uh, bill or a physician's bill, uh, this organization would help support you during that time. You could be a member of, of this organization, join and, and pay a small fee. And if something um, occurred uh, within your family or, or within the community, they were there to help support. Um, this was also a music venue where there were dances and various parties and, and fundraisers held to um, support this organization. Um, we are excited to, to start working on this building and will soon, uh, in the near future, um, have it where you can go inside and enjoy um, some of this history that uh, has been left here in our community. This is the True Friends Benevolent Hall. Built of Cyprus, this building was built by the men who were members of that organization. They raised money and um, if they were carpenters and brick masons, uh, they volunteered after work and uh, became a part of uh, building this structure that you see here. Inside our museum, you see the photograph of the gentleman uh, direct center. That is L.L. Fernandez. Would you believe when we went into that building um, several years ago, that photograph was still hanging upstairs in the, um, in their meeting area. He is the founding member. His name is L. L. Fernandez. You'll see photographs um, directly underneath there of some parties and uh, balls and various uh, events held uh, in the uh, True Friends Benevolent Hall. Again, another view of the corner of Williams and Lasard Street. In the background, you see the big blue building. Um, that building is um, the Rosenwald School. Um, this building is actually called the Central Agricultural School. It was um, built in Romeville, Louisiana, or Central Louisiana, right across the river from here in Donisonville. Um, this building was built in the 1930s to educate uh, African-American kids throughout the rural South. Uh, education was important, and um, these kids have been denied uh, access to schooling and to the ability to go into a place where education thrived. And so these schools were built by Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. They joined forces with community leaders and community um, concerns of educating those people in rural communities. This was considered the one room schoolhouse. And um, you could go to the seventh grade in this building. Um, if you notice the structure of the windows, um, if you see these buildings in your community, you can notice by the structure of this building and the windows uh, dictate uh, that it was part of the Rosenwald project. Many of these buildings um, still exist uh, around uh, the country, but here in Louisiana, this is the third building still standing, um, representing education from that period um, with Rosenwald and Booker T. Um, again, we're in the process of restoring this building. We had it moved across the river um, and then reassembled here at this spot. It's been here uh, several years, and uh, this year we're starting the permit process and getting ready to restore the interiors. And so uh, we say within the, by the end of the year, uh, this building will be ready for you to go in and actually uh, see what education was like for African Americans in rural communities, especially here in South Louisiana. This building um, will serve as a community center and uh, a reminder to everyone of the importance of education uh, even today, uh, as we see what goes on in our communities with education, can you imagine the scholars and the, and the individuals who were uh, taught in these buildings who went on to 
um, doctors, uh, professional people um, within our communities. Uh, right now, you're taking a peep at what is called the Freedom Garden. Our museum campus is, is all around this community. It's not just in, in the building that you saw at the beginning of the video, but uh, has spread to the True Friends Hall, to the Rosenwald School, and also um, it encompasses what is called the Freedom Garden. Uh, we partnered with the Michelle Obama Let's Move movement, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield, who helped support us in teaching our community about food ways and about good food. Um, you can grow your own gardens and plant your own food. Uh, during the pandemic, um, we see that many people have begun to uh, do home gardening. I know a lot of you out there listening and probably talking to, or thinking about the gardens that you started during this pandemic. But our, our purpose here is to educate and to talk about uh, healthy eating. If you were on a plantation and you were running away, you didn't have many choices of healthy eating, but you knew there were certain things in the woods and, and certain indigenous plants that would sustain you during that time. And so we talk about what would you eat if you ran away um, from a plantation? Muscadines grew wild in the woods and various berries and various uh, types of plants that you could actually eat to survive. What about poison ivy and poison oak? You had to be able to, to decipher and know the difference between these plants because it could be uh, part of your success in getting away from uh, those plantations. Most of the um, People who lived on those, who were enslaved on those plantations did have small gardens where they did raise uh, special crops, uh, food that they could eat and sustain themselves outside of the food that was being served. The building that you see here is uh, the home of Sylvia Watkins. Miss Watkins was the great granddaughter of Dr. Lori. Um, this home uh, now houses our museum and is located at 406 Charles Street. And uh, we welcome visitors um, to come and, and learn of this history um, that we live uh, all around us in the, the sugarcane fields and the plantations and the history uh, that we're constantly reminded. But if you come inside this museum, you'll learn more about this history other than just what happened on those plantations. We're happy to be here in the city of Donaldsonville. We were located at Tescuco Plantation for many years, uh, which limited our visitors. Uh, once you come inside of our museum, you'll get a chance to see this map that you see here on the wall. Um, this is the uh, Purcell's map from 1858. And it shows all of the plantations uh, between Natchez, Mississippi, where the pink and the blue is on the left-hand side. Um, and the river runs down right through the middle of that, um, that diagram. And if you follow the pink and blue all the way down to the yellow and green, the pink and blue were cotton plantations. So you see that's in the northern part of the state on up into Mississippi. As you come into the southern part of the state, you see the yellow and the green markings. These represent all of the sugarcane plantations. So if you look at that, you can see there were thousands of plantations located all along the Mississippi River. Mississippi River was being the uh, major mode of transportation during that time. And so if you had a plantation or were a part of that um, economic uh, process, then you needed to have riverfront property. So you see all of these plantations aligning themselves along the Mississippi River. They grew various crops from cotton to sugar cane to rice and, and many other products, but sugar became the most important product here in South Louisiana. Our museum celebrates artists uh, as well as history and the artwork uh, that you see um, shared throughout our museum. Uh, I'll mention some of those artists. One of them is the um, known artist here in Donaldsonville, Alvin Baptiste. And uh, if you're familiar with Alvin, Alvin has a shop right here in Donaldsonville, uh, not far from our Central Parish Library. And um, 
we invite you to go and visit and learn more about Alvin's work. The flags that you see on the wall here are um, from an artist by the name of Malika Favorite. Malika was born in Geismar, Louisiana, and is a local uh, resident here today. She is our resident artist, and um, we'll share some more of her artwork as we move through uh, our virtual exhibit today. If you look at those flags, um, you see it here, and know about the controversy of the flag and how the flag has represented America. Uh, we just want to make sure that the history is included in the representation. Um, yeah, there were some good things that happened under those flags, but there were some things that happened under those flags that uh, we're still trying to work out today. And so as you look at that artwork, think about uh, some of the dynamics of freedom and how uh, freedom um, was represented then. And, and what do you think about freedom today? Our motto is seeking to know the past in order to understand the future. So you, uh, as you take a look around this museum, you'll see photographs and documents from the past. Uh, what we want to do is share this with our community and the world so that you can understand the dynamics of what happened here in South Louisiana during um, the after dog of the slavery period. The panels that you see on this back wall, we have a, a list of panels here with over 500 names. Um, in 1858, a gentleman by the name of John Preston sells to John Burnside. You've heard of the community of Burnside, Louisiana. It was named after John Burnside, who was the owner of the Homeless House Plantation located on the east bank of the river. John Burnside purchases 500 enslaved uh, and they walk from South Carolina to Louisiana. Can you imagine uh, that journey uh, being uh, dispersed throughout the United States? Um, as they traveled um, through many of those states, uh, a lot of those people were, were sold to various planters and various uh, farmers along the way. Uh, you may have started out with, a, with your entire family, uh, but by the time you reached your destination, um, it could have been just you and uh, maybe one other family member. Uh, if you look at that list up close, you see some numbers. Um, uh, you see the name Bendego Taylor, 60 years old, Amy Taylor, 60. We assume that that would be a family there. If you look at all of those names, Taylor, uh, you probably see a mother and a father, uh, some children, and then maybe even grandchildren within that list. We also see names like Kelson and Bartley. And um, these are names of, of families who still live in this community. So if you're doing uh, genealogy and looking for relatives and trying to do some uh, ancestral research, uh, these could be your family members listed right here on this list. Uh, can you imagine taking a list like this to the bank and receiving a loan up to a million dollars? Um, this was your workforce. And so if you had over 500 uh, within that workforce, then uh, you were considered valuable. And one of the largest sugar producing plantations here in South Louisiana existed on the property owned by John Burnside. You also see names of the Donaldson and the Clark place. These were adjacent uh, plantations, which also shared uh, some of the um, Enslaved people were rented or leased out to other farmers. So you'll see names uh, representing those other plantations from nearby. Sometimes family owned more than one plantation and they would share the work um, within those spaces. Some of those names, first and last names, some of them didn't have first and last names. Can you imagine trying to do research uh, on your family and noticing a name uh, without a last name, and, and that could have been someone closely related. Uh, as we take you into the, the kitchen area within our exhibit, uh, again, I'd like to introduce you to our resident artist, Malika Favorite. Uh, the young girl that you see on the wall there, her name is uh, Pepper Cayenne, and uh, she represents the innocent of little young Black girls who were forced into working and and having to be um, um, in an environment where they weren't safe, where they weren't protected, where they were 
uh, uh, abused and misused. Um, this young girl uh, represents all of those young, uh, vibrant young ladies who, who were able to su sustain themselves during those periods. Um, and a very beautiful piece of artwork. You'll see a cotton sack up in the uh, top left corner and various implements used um, on the farm as far as cooking, um, you see graters uh, used for grating cheese and various other products. Um, you also see the colored and the white uh, signs that were part of the Jim Crow era, which separated um, dining and restroom facilities. Uh, and I'm excited right now because uh, this is Pierre Calis Landry. He is one of the highlights of our museum. Pierre was born uh, at the Prevost Plantation, not far from here in Donaldsonville. His mother, the enslaved, his father, Rosamond Landry, uh, one of the owners of that plantation. Born free, um, raised by a family of free people of color. Pierre Landry was educated, uh, had the opportunities that any free child would have. But at the age of 16, he was sold into slavery. Can you imagine that, born free? And then at the age of 16, being sold into slavery for $1,665, sold to a plantation right here um, called the Homeless Plantation. When Pierre arrived at that plantation, he had uh, the ability to read and write and, and could do it um, just as well as anyone else on the plantation. He was considered um, somewhat of a, an asset and was given various jobs around the plantation. He ends up uh, becoming the manager of the general store and running almost the entire plantation. He was also a confectioner and um, uh, created all kinds of sweets. I mean, if you're on a plantation that, that has all of this sugar, um, why not uh, use your ability to create these sweets? Pierre Landry um, is Freed in uh, 1865 uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation. Would you believe that three years later, he becomes the first African-American mayor elected anywhere in the United States? Pierre Calise Landry um, was a gentleman who used his education and value. He becomes a, a Methodist minister, um, joins up and becomes the founder of the St. Peter United Methodist Church located here in Donisonville. Pierre Landry also becomes a, uh, a philanthropist and wants to educate more kids. So he's going around uh, various parts of Louisiana with the Methodist Church, building schools and building churches uh, to educate and not only uh, in, and have opportunity for um, many of these African-Americans to become religious um, participants in the Methodist Church. Pierre Landry is appointed by Union Success Grant as the uh, postmaster. He also serves as tax collector. This is during a real, really uh, turbulent time called Reconstruction. Not only Pierre Landry, but uh, various other politicians served uh, during that time. Um, we had a lieutenant governor by the name of O.J. Dunn. Uh, if you want to learn more about O.J. Dunn, I, I suggest you go to the library and, and learn, pick up one of those books and learn about uh, O.J. Dunn, who was the lieutenant governor for the state of Louisiana. Also during that time, PBS Pinchback becomes the governor of Louisiana, and, as well as many, um, as you see in the the poster right under the, um, the statue of, of Pierre Landry, there's a poster showing all of those who were elected to the House of Representatives during that time. Um, it was Reconstruction. Black men were allowed to vote, and uh, we outvoted them uh, during that election. As you uh, look around the room, you'll see posters of various other elections that took place during that time. Uh, or should I say in the later on period, uh, during the 60s, if you look up right above that television monitor, you'll see um, some of those elected officials from the 1960s who were elected um, from Iberville Parish. Uh, down uh, right next to the fireplace uh, between Pierre Landry and the TV monitor, there is a voting box. It says Iberville Parish. Can you imagine 
placing your votes into the box and um, having those votes counted. Do you trust that box? Do you trust those counting the box? Today, um, with our election going on, we have problems now. I think they're still counting votes uh, from an election that we just had. Um, and so you can imagine how those votes were probably tampered with during that process. Yes, during Reconstruction, we were able to elect many um, African-American officials. But after this period comes a time of turbulence and turmoil. Uh, Jim Crow, uh, the Ku Klux Klan steps in and then begins to tamper with the votes and kind of disenfranchise those voters from even going to the polls. Um, and if you look at our history, we'll never have uh, another black governor in the state of Louisiana after that period. Uh, you see a, a, a painting in the top with the flag, Martin Luther King and uh, President Obama, uh, showing that uh, when you're allowed to vote and uh, voting privileges are allowed for those who are registered and uh, residents of America, uh, things change. And uh, you can see that with the election process, uh, even today. If you want to know more about reconstruction and politics, um, we ask that you again visit uh, our local library. Come to our museum and learn more of that history as well. The photograph that you see here is of a gentleman by the name of Leonard Julian, born uh, on, in Modest, Louisiana, and raised on the Africa plantation. This gentleman invents uh, the sugarcane planting machine, which revolutionizes the whole planting of sugarcane and the industry of sugar. Uh, 1964, this takes place. So you can see up until 1964, the process of planting sugarcane was all done by hand. But if you take a look at this, this machine, we have two of those machines in our uh, care. Um, one that's being processed and, and being re refurbished uh, and will be part of our exhibit here at the museum. We invite you to come out and learn about how these men uh, who were farmers and part of that agricultural uh, process uh, became inventors um, and wanted to make the job easier uh, for those who, who worked in, in that farming industry. For many years, it was hard, tedious work. Um, planting sugar cane was, was not easy. Um, processing it was not easy. Many of the lives on those plantations were uh, ruined and destroyed during this process. They say the average lifespan of an enslaved person on a sugar plantation was about seven years. When I say lifespan, I'm talking about their working lifespan. Yes, their lives existed beyond that, but their work ability within those seven years would decline after the process. So here we pay tribute to Leonard Julian, not only an inventor, but a musician as well. And we'll learn about Leonard Julian uh, a little bit more as we go through this virtue. Once again, COVID has, has put us in a place where we're now doing a lot of the uh, virtual type of um, interactions that you see here today with Zoom. It gives us an opportunity to share uh, our museum uh, not only with visitors in uh, the physical light, but uh, you can do it virtually here. And so we're glad to see that many of you have signed up to take this virtual tour. Um, you see a postage stamp there and it says Black Heritage. And uh, right underneath it, it says Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker, another uh, entrepreneur and inventor uh, celebrated here in our museum. Even though slavery was harsh and brutal and bitter, um, here you have people um, right out of slavery uh, trying to, to acclimate themselves and become part of a system that denied them uh, all rights and all privileges. Madam C.J. Walker rises to that occasion. Uh, she creates a product that helps you to grow hair. And um, for all of you female listeners out there, if you can grow hair, uh, I think uh, many women would still be buying her products today. Madam C.J. Walker creates a hair growing product that uh, everybody wants to have. And she becomes um, uh, what we call the Mary Kay or the Avon lady of that day. 
her products were on sale in various places around the U.S. and in uh, a few foreign countries. Madam C.J. Walker, born in Delta, Louisiana, which is right on the other side of Natchez, uh, between here uh, Natchez and Monroe. Um, Madam C.J. Walker um, creates her own products. Uh, many people give her credit for the straightening cone, um, but Madam C.J. Walker's notoriety comes from literally from the hair growing process. Once you grew the hair, then you had to be able to manicure it and. Uh, so products like straightening combs and various products for the hair, the straightening was also created by Madam C.J. Walker, um, giving her the ability to pull herself up and uh, buy herself a mansion. Um, uh, you can see photographs there um, with some of her exhibit and becomes the first self-made female millionaire in the United States of America. And we pay tribute to Madam C.J. Walker at our museum. Uh, you see a singer sewing machine there as well, and uh, most women of the day could sew, and that was part of their um, upbringing. You could sew and you could uh, make your own clothing, and it set you apart from many. As we move on to uh, the next portion of our exhibit, um, this exhibit is now a virtual exhibit um, through our museum, and we have a QR code that's posted right outside the door. Um, you can also access it through our website. But this uh, exhibit is uh, the rural roots of jazz. And we pay tribute here to many of those musicians who were born in the rural parishes, uh, in the river parishes between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Many of those musicians who left these small communities went to New Orleans and became famous. Now, if you're a musician during that time and you told someone that you were from New Orleans, Matter of fact, your pay increased, just increased or doubled because New Orleans musicians were valued, still valued today um, around the world, especially in the genre of jazz. And so as you look around, you see faces of many uh, jazz musicians. Um, we say that jazz is the ultimate expression of freedom. Um, many of these musicians who didn't have the freedom to, to move around um, in their day-to-day -day lives, um, when they put up their musical instruments and, and began to play this music, freedom began to flow from those horns um, out of them into a world that uh, really didn't appreciate uh, them to the fullest. Um, I'll pause right here, and um, if anybody can spot the Pink Panther on the wall, um, there's a musician by the name of Plas Johnson. Uh, if you find the Pink Panther, why is he here in Donisonville? Would you believe that Plas Johnson, born here in Donisonville, is the music musician who plays the music from the theme from the Pink Panther cartoon? Now, isn't that worth celebrating? Um, we know a lot of history. We know about Rosa Parks. We know about uh, Malcolm. And we know about Martin Luther King, but did you know that the original music for the Pink Panther cartoon was played by a black man who was born right here in Donaldsonville? Um, and that's why our museum is, is such a, a, a great place to learn your history, uh, especially the local history. Um, we're inundated uh, every year during Black history about the history of those um, who are famous uh, for for all of the, the strides of, of, of creating a place where we all can live uh, uh, freely. Um, but did you know that uh, these musicians, such as Plas Johnson, Dave Bartholomew, um, Fats Domino, uh, Reynolds Richard, many of these musicians went on to play with um, famous musicians who went on, like James Brown, who became world renowned. Um, no, they weren't famous as James, but they were the musicians behind James that supported the music, whether they were writing the songs or playing the background music and uh, to support. This exhibit was put together with um, a collaboration between the uh, National Park Service, uh, and we say thanks to them as well. Here, you're right outside of our museum, and you're in the Bicentennial Jazz Plaza. Um, uh, this plaza has been dedicated to those musicians 
one uh, musician that I like to uh, invite you to introduce you to. His name was King Oliver. King Oliver uh, gives Louis Armstrong his story. King Oliver was born here in Avon, Louisiana, which is a little town right outside of Donaldsonville. King Oliver uh, is known for the King Oliver Jazz Band. Um, Louis Armstrong becomes a member of his band at an early age, and King Oliver becomes his mentor, and uh, we know that Louis Armstrong, today's Satchmo, as he's called, is the father of jazz. So if he's the father, uh, we say that King Oliver has to be the godfather or the grandfather of jazz, and we say that the rural roots of jazz begin right here in the river parish, um, Donaldsonville being one of the centers for music. So this bicentennial uh, marker here uh, highlights all of those musicians um, who were once a part of the music industry along this river. Uh, the building that you see here is where I'm sitting inside, and if you could look through the door, you'd see me uh, sitting right inside. Uh, and I welcome you to come inside of this room as well, where we talk about um, the Purchase Lives exhibit. This exhibit that you see here is a part of the um, historic New Orleans collection, and it talks about New Orleans being the largest slave port uh, in the South. Uh, anyone who was a slave in, in this area, um, if you didn't come uh, through the Port of New Orleans, you were probably transported across land. Um, after the domestic, after the international slave trade was um, um, abolished, uh, domestic slave trade took place and um, slaves were then shared um, throughout the United States. Purchase lives, um, think about the French quarters. We're, we're in the French quarters um, on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, Mardi Gras season, we would be in the French quarters today, not realizing that we were standing on soil where the Africans were brought and sold um, here in um, southern Louisiana. This exhibit, again, uh, talks about um, that process of being sold, uh, families being separated, uh, children. Uh, separated from mothers, mothers separated from husbands and wives, and, and how that process um, was forced on these people once they arrived in this new land. Um, you see that ship um, in the corner there on the left-hand side of the screen. Many of those Africans who were brought to the Americas were transported on ships across the Atlantic Ocean, known as the Middle Passage. Once you uh, survive that journey, only the strong can survive that trip across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, harsh conditions, um, very little food. Uh, and you talk about sanitation, um, it's lucky anyone survived. But these Africans were strong and um, wanted to uh, be survivors. Only the strong can survive anyway. And if you saw people around you uh, falling, um, it gave you more strength to, to be the ones to, to sustain this journey. Not even knowing where you're going, can you imagine uh, getting on a ship? Many of us take cruises and we know where we're going. Uh, and we're still not really uh, safe or feel safe. But can you imagine boarding a ship headed for uh, a place that you had never been before um, to become enslaved and work uh, for the wealth and the economics of someone who did not appreciate um, the value of your work. Here you see a, um, um, a piece of art uh, that was donated to our museum. Uh, we have three um, of these bronze statues donated by an artist by the name of Linda Balters. And um, all three of these statues are women and it represents the Afri African-American woman and her ability uh, to work during this process. You see her uh, washing, um, picking cotton um, at the well. Um, you were working uh, not for freedom, but uh, for someone else's um, freedom and, and to, to for the wealth of someone else. 
Linda Walters um, visited our museum, fell in love with our exhibit and donated all three of those statues um, to us. And uh, we say thanks to Linda Walters. Once again, uh, we thank you for uh, visiting with us today at the uh, River Road African American Museum. This is only a glimpse of the history and um, the work that is being done here. This is the QR code here um, that you can actually um, photograph. I think here, if you put your phone up to the screen, um, you'll be able to um, capture that QR code and um, take a virtual tour of the jazz exhibit. Um, if not, go to our website. Uh, we're at uh, www. Uh, aamuseum.org and um, you'll be able to visit that um, exhibit as well. Again, um, our museum has been around for 26 years and a lot of people really don't even know we exist, but we're working with uh, our partners here in our community, uh, such as the Ascension Parish Library, um, some of our corporate um, um, uh, sponsors who are helping us to uh, spread the word and talk about this history. Um, with the what's going on in our community, we, we see that Black Lives Matter and, and all of the history and, and the things that we see around us. Many people are, are in tune to, to learn more of this history. We invite you to come to River Road African American Museum located in the part of historic Donaldsonville where we celebrate um, the hardships um, and the successes of the African Americans here in South Louisiana. I'm Rick and I am the director here. Once again, thank you for supporting our museum. And if you have any questions, uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, you can type your questions into the chat. Uh, my sound was temporary. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I mentioned uh, Pierre Landry. Somebody um, had a question about Pierre Landry. Uh, Pierre Landry, once again, was the, the first Black mayor elected in the United States. Uh, would you believe his son is L.B. Landry, who is the namesake for L.B. Landry High School in Algiers? Uh, his son, L.B. Landry, was Lord Beaconsfield Landry, who was also uh, a physician, an uh, educated man here in South Louisiana. Um, I'm looking at our chat site to see if there are any questions. I know you guys have many questions and many um, uh, things that you would like to know about our museum. You can support our museum by going to our website. Uh, there's a place where you can make donations, you can book tours, you can um, also learn more of the history just by, by visiting the website. We also invite you to come to the Ascension Parish Library here and do more research and learn uh, about your families, genealogy, as well as uh, the history of Donaldsonville. Um, thank you uh, for participating once again. I hope that uh, it gave you an idea of what's going on here in Donaldsonville. This town has um, a wealth of history um, and um, we invite you to learn more, more of this history by coming to our museum and visiting the town of Donaldsonville. Um, I see a hand up and um, uh, maybe there's a question. Uh, I see some comments. They enjoyed it. Uh, it's very educational. Um, it says, how many people are allowed to come inside um, as a group during COVID? Uh, great question. Most of our tours are, are done um, uh, indoors and outdoors. We have a, a community of spaces. So uh, we allow four to five at a time uh, with small groups. Uh, if you come with groups uh, larger than that, we'll, we'll divide you into smaller groups and, and spread you out so that we remain safe during this in, in time. Um, thanks to all of my family and friends who supported us. I'd like to dedicate uh, this virtual exhibit to my brother, Harold Hambrick uh, Jr., who was one of our founders and one of our great supporters um, of our museum. Um, thank you, Harold, for giving us the insight and the the motivation to continue to share this history with uh, not only our family, but with uh, the family of the world who um, needs to know and needs to learn more about um, this history. Um, to visit our museum, it's a $10 donation fee. 
Um, you can um, go to our website where it says book a tour and uh, put your information in and we'll be glad to uh, schedule a tour for you. Uh, hopefully after COVID and all of this clears up, uh, we'll go back to our large bus tours, family reunions and group tours uh, where people come from around the world to, to learn its history. If you live here locally, uh, please come and learn your local history. Uh, there are a lot of local people who don't even know this history, so we invite you. Says, did Dr. Lowry only see African-American patients? Um, during that time, can you imagine going to the doctor's office uh, and waiting all day to see the doctor? And he comes out at the end of the day and says, I'm not seeing any more patients. That was the plight for many African-Americans um, who had to attend doctor's offices where they weren't really welcome. You sit outside in what was known as the colored waiting room. And uh, sometimes you have to be there a week. You may be visiting an aunt from out of town um, to see the doctor. And so every day you went down to that doctor's office. Dr. Lori and him, um, these five doctors went, got their education and they waited on anyone who needed medical assistance. Uh, blacks, whites, uh, whether you had the money, whether you didn't have the money. Um, they were concerned about the health care of those individuals who didn't have access to health care. Are there any other questions? Dr. Lori, Dr. Brazier, um, these were educated men during the, the early 1900s who, who really um, went to, to university and came back to their community. Um, a lot of times kids today will go to universities and they move on, never come back to work in their communities. But we applaud them for coming back and creating a place where they made life better for those individuals who didn't have those opportunities to, to leave these communities. Um, Donaldsonville has a great history. It's the third oldest city in the state of Louisiana, uh, had the largest population of free people of color outside of New Orleans. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, a comment here says that we can learn from the lessons of Dr. Lori, uh, the Dr. Lori's of the world. There are many lessons to be learned here today and um, where we are in the, the, the search for history and the plight of the African-American in the United States. Is, I, I, I um, encourage everyone to come and learn how did we survive during these hardships? How did we sustain ourselves? How did we... Um, encourage ourselves to keep going in a place where um, many obstacles were, were always placed in front of us. But um, the Rosenwald story, the Booker T story, the True Friends Hall story, Dr. Lori, um, Pierre Calise Landry, all of these stories of success um, radiate here at our museum and we try to encourage uh, us to learn this history from the past so that we don't make the mistakes in the future. Once again, thank you guys for, for signing in. This, this Zoom will be available on the uh, YouTube uh, channel here, uh, part of our museum, part of the library. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to, to, to see it, uh, share it with uh, your friends and family. If you live outside of Louisiana, we encourage you to uh, make a trip to Louisiana, to Donaldsonville, discover Donaldsonville and learn the rich history of the African-Americans who were enslaved on the plantations um, from uh, Baton Rouge to New Orleans, um, the descendant families, learn about those families that still live in this community, um, who work in these chemical plants, who live uh, in the shadows of not only plantations, but uh, the chemical industry as well. Um, and this is my time to say farewell. And once again, thank you for being part of this virtual experience. Um, quite a different experience for me because I'm used to engaging an audience here at our museum. But once again, during COVID, this is the way life has changed. Once again, thank you on behalf of the staff, our board members, our founder, Kathy Hambrick um, of the River Road African American Museum. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you.